Introduce yourselves and what you play. Uh, I'm Mark McIntyre. I was the drummer. Uh, Eric Wilfong. I was the bassist and vocalist. Eddie Becker, guitarist. And your band was? The, the Valours. So tell me about the Valours and the, and, and the significance of the Wheaton Youth Center here. <sighs> uh, <laughs> Was to start back, uh, Eric and I uh, went to Kensington Junior High School together and we um, uh, started playing music uh, originally with a group called the Fidelities and then when the Fidelities kind of broke up and went on, Eric and I joined up with Mark McInturf and we formed a trio called the Valours and we were playing uh, mostly the uh, rascal style rock but we also played a lot of rhythm and blues we played Otis Redding we played Wilson Pickett Sam and Dave and uh, at the Bethesda Youth Center uh, we picked up three horns uh, that came over from Waller Johnson High School and uh, St. Albans uh, they came from the Viscounts they came from the Viscounts uh, Jack Bryant's old group uh, when, the, when Jack Bryant uh, broke up with the Viscounts and started the Falling Angels, the horns came over to us and we became the Wars uh, as a six-piece show band. And we played a lot at the Bethesda Youth Center and we started to play up here and we won the Battle of the Bands in 1965 and 1966. So what do you think about being back here today with, uh, you know, what's a lobby? Well, it's a lot friendlier than it was when we did the Battle of the Bands <laughs> up here because we were Bethesda boys, and this was the Wheaton Youth Center, not the Bethesda Youth Center, so the bands that we were up against were like local to this place more than we were, so it was kind of like their house, and uh, so it was, it was gratifying uh, winning two years in a row, but uh, this, is, this is real nice today. It's a nice, friendly uh, vibe in here. So your bands were, so you guys were, now describe what the Battle of the Bands was like. What would that be like inside that? that? Yeah. It was full. It was uh, there were probably four or five bands. Yeah. Something like that. You know, it was it was a big show kind of thing. And you really you had what, fifteen minutes or something? Half an hour. Oh no, it was longer than that. You know, to, to put it all together. You had to be tight and we were a tight group. For that first battle of the bands, I think one of the things that set us apart uh, we uh, really liked James Brown a lot. Uh, we thought that his band was one of the greatest in the, in the show business at the time, and we played the James Brown Live at the Apollo uh, as our last showpiece for that, and, and Eric just uh, really uh, ripped it up and kind of set the place on fire, so to speak. But we had, it was uh, fun. <laughs> back in those days, we had uh, the uh, matching uh, uh, horn stands, the, the, the pedestals that were all bright red and white. And Bob Metz, the, uh, the, the trumpet player, had uh, uh, custom made uh, floor lamps at the time. You can actually see those in the picture that I operated from a foot controller. So, so he went to places like Lafayette Electronics and actually built that. And we were one of the first bands in the area to actually use a, a floor light show. Uh, back at, at that time, too. So you were doing James Brown? James Brown, Otis Redding. I was, we, we started out, you know, we were still doing some of the things that we did as a trio. Uh, and our, you know, our musical tastes came from 50s and 60s AM radio, which was, you know, not segmented yet as it, you know, as it happened to it in the, in the 60s, in the 70s. And, and so we came up, you know, listening to, you know, Chicago radio stations that we could get in only at night and that kind of stuff. So we were, you know, we were getting this mix of music and our repertoire was a lot like that. But, uh, you know, back when all of our buddies and cohorts were kind of getting into the British stuff, we were getting into old 50s R&B and old 60s R&B and, and soul music. And then we acquired this horn thing and just kept pumping out the, the soul music. and. Uh, and then all of a sudden in 65 and 66, white America came alive to soul music and we already had this huge repertoire in this following and it was, uh, it was a gas for a couple of years. And I screwed it all up by going away to college, but <laughs> oh well. Yeah. Tell me about the, this was kind of greaser territory. Uh, a classic greaser outfit back in those days were uh, the gabardine pants, khaki or dark green with uh, bandolon shirts, uh, black bandolon shirts, kind of like what Mark's wearing right now. And, uh, Chuck Taylors. 
Chuck Taylors or Burgans, the yeah. pointed, the real pointed Italian uh, shoes that you would see in, in, in movies like uh, West Side Story. And uh, Hot Rod, uh, the, the muscle cars were a big part of the culture also. Uh, there was a lot of fast cars that were uh, driving around at the youth center and then after the youth center they'd all go to the Hot Shops which was up at the corner of uh, Wheaton. But, point of fact, the economics of Wheaton as opposed to the economics of Bethesda were more blue collar and you know, lower income. And uh, so there was kind of this rivalry you know, all the time. And, and uh, the kids from Wheaton and Rockville, who hung out down here also, uh, you know, they called the Bethesda boys preppies and stuff. You know? <laughs> so they were, yeah, they were a little more uh, edgy. Describe that culture, the Battle of the Bands culture, and how significant that was for bragging rights. Well, it was kind of, I mean, being here that night, there were, you know, there were fans of all of the represented groups and uh, so they're all you know screaming for their team and uh, and it was crazy but the uh, the second one I had been to a James Brown show where luckily I had scrambled under the seats and acquired one of these huge gaudy god-awful crap jo costume jewelry cufflinks that he used to throw into the crowd and I had it in my pocket as a good luck piece and during the Battle of the Bands, I just decided, this is too cool. This is too <laughs> cool. So I, you know, basically the, we were in a thing where I could riff, and I just started talking to the crowd during this James Brown Live thing, and told them about how I had acquired this cufflink, and how I loved the thing, but the crowd was really giving it up, and I was going to give it up, and I threw it out into the crowd, and the place went nuts. It was cool. It was cool. And but I did. wish I still had it. <laughs> <laughs> did James Brown play here at the Wheaton Youth Center? I don't know. No, I don't think so. I mean, I saw something that he had played at Walter John. He played at the Howard all the time. We, well, all of us used to hang out at the Howard and see all the RBX yeah. down there. That's, that's, like, so that's where you'd go to you know, see. What was that like for you know, being the white guy, I mean, being the white kids? Uh, he went until to the matinee shows. Until 65 and 66, it was a little more tense than, you know, than afterward, but, uh, you know, we never got our butts kicked or anything. It was, you know, we made, we made it home safely. <laughs> but, yeah, but you could go down there and see, you know, you could see James Brown, you could see any number of acts in one night. It was, it was really, it was like the Apollo, yeah. but it was in Washington, and it was just, you know, we were going to go see it. It didn't matter what it took. Yeah. And, and uh, the prices were just stupid. I mean, well, you could go and see the Motown Review with, you know, The Temptations and Mary Wells and Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder and, you know, for like two bucks. Literally, two bucks. I mean, it was just crazy. Then we go to Waxy Maxi's across the street. That was the definitive R&B record store to be able to buy the kind of music that we wanted to learn how to play. And we weren't going to get that. We, we could get that at Empire Records. They would special order that kind of stuff for us. But you wouldn't be picking it up at Variety Records. That was around here. Yeah, the record stores. I mean, there were so many of the different record stores around. That was like, you know, it's like a lost business shopping experience. Yeah, they were, they were they were little boutique shops. I mean, there might be one or two of any one, you know, chain. There were no chains. Yeah. Uh, so the certain ones, you know, featured more soul. The ones downtown. Yeah. And you had listening stations there, so that you can go get the the record and put it on and listen to it through headphones before you were to buy it. So that was a. But it's lost now. It's part of the, the lost culture. Is, is there anything more you want to say about I mean, your, your experiences as you know, the, the, from the 60s of the bands and playing there with the, and being on stage? Well, like this? it was a subculture. I mean, I think that when you go, you know, you're talking about you know, what was the feeling at the Battle of the Bands, you know, we all knew each other. We all kind of went to school together and so forth, and there was a friendly kind of competition where you really saw it most was really odd at Hot Shops in Bethesda on Saturday night after all the places would close, all the bands would be there. And you could look around, you'd see that these guys in their blue tuxedos, these guys in their yellow tuxedos, we'd be in our burgundy tuxedos. All the bands were there at the same time. So there was this kind of, it was really, it was pretty quick to group. Yeah. Most of us connected more with music than school. Yeah. And we did, uh, after the, the, the second battle of the bands, uh, one of the things that we got involved with, uh, we became a lot closer with the, the, the folks that were running 
I believe this fellow's name was Bob Crane, is that correct? Yep. Uh, and Bob had us as a house band for these talent shows where we had like the McCockney brothers, we backed them up and a number of the people that were good uh, artists and just didn't have a, a band behind them at the time. And it was up on that stage that was in there that we would uh, host the show. And we kind of set it up like James Brown. We would play a couple of little ditties that James Brown would be able to bring one act on while another act was exiting. And, and uh, we, we kind of framed ourselves around his review. So you almost did like a review. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Yeah, you know, yeah, after the, after the, you know, in the time period following the Battle <coughs> of the Bands. Was, you know, what, it, what would happen when you would win Battle of the Bands? What would the, how would that go? Would they crown you? What, would the, what was the, what would they do here? Would they give you a plaque or the key to the city or something? Plaque, trophy, something. I think yeah. they just told you you won. That's really all you wanted to know. It yeah. was a gig. Yeah. You, know, you, you were guaranteed uh, a couple of gigs out of, out of the show, but it really wasn't, it wasn't a trophy or anything like that. And then there was a, a competition between the Bethesda Youth Center and the Wheat Youth Center for you know who had the best Battle of the Bands. Uh, um, uh, Bob Daniels over there uh, started hosting his own Battle of the Bands, which got um, a, a, a different uh, slice of of the the, of the, the county musicians, uh, right? Montgomery County musicians yeah. coming in there. Is there any more you want to say about like you know? I mean, I can. The only other thing I'd say about the Valors, which really made us pretty unique and I think pretty easily managed in a way was that we were a small group, six pieces, but of those six pieces, three were horns. And so you had a lot of brass, a lot of volume, and a lot of show stuff for a small group. Like normally, you, with three horns, you've got nine pieces, and that's an unartifordable band. You know, it's kind of like Gellington or something. You know, but with six pieces, now I actually don't know any other group ever that's done that. And part of it is that Eric could play bass and sing, and so he was covering two, two instruments, and Eddie was a great guitar player, so we didn't need a keyboard. And we had come up together as a trio as a for trio. a couple of years before we added the horns. So, you know, when you're doing a trio, you got to be tight. Yeah. You know, drums, bass, and guitar, if, you know, if, no that's, all you're, hide. if that's all you're bringing, <laughs> everybody's got to be aware of everybody else and leaving space and filling where they need to. And, and uh, so this, as a, as a core rhythm section, we were really good, I think, for the day before we added the horns, so that was just icing on the cake to me. We, we led the way with the trio idea. The police followed later. <laughs> <laughs> Sting eat your heart out. Mm -hmm. That's a good moment to end on. Great. Yeah, well, yeah. one last thing, sure. uh, Jeff. I, I think it's great what you're doing because uh, one of the things that I know of uh, personally is that the youth centers were really, really go-to places for the kids to hang out as compared to getting in trouble and, and, and doing other things that would you know, lead them into uh, uh, situations that weren't quite so wholesome. Uh, I don't know what the kids do today. You know, I don't think that there's the, this many venues uh, certainly not in Montgomery County. I know that Bethesda has, has closed down. It's nice to see that the Wheaton is, has remained open and, and accessible to the oh, kids. It's extraordinary. It looks the same. You know, it, does. It, does. it really it's does. It's weird to be here. It's been four it is. Years. It is. <laughs> Just getting out of the parking lot yeah. and approaching the place was like, whoa, yeah. this is yeah. like time warp city here. Yeah. 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 But your, your effort uh, on this to, to show a little slice of Montgomery County history and Mark's effort with Capitol Rock, I mean, it, Back in those days, we had a lot of bands, there was a lot of talent, uh, a lot of them went on to uh, uh, a number of, of uh, big name groups like Jefferson Airplane and uh, Hot Tuna and, and Nils playing with Bruce Springsteen, so it was a real camaraderie that we had around here. Well, we're very, you know, it's been exciting. I'm just, I'm still going to process all of this after the fact. No doubt. No.